Welcome to lecture nine, security technology. All right, so it, this semester so far, we've talked a lot about, uh, we, we did get a little technical in the uh, networking lecture, and then we kind of have been talking more at the high level of like, this is what malware is, or this is how hackers act. This particular lecture, we're gonna get kind of a blend between technology and uh, kind of operational um, capability, right? So when we're done talking today, we're gonna talk about how scanners basically work, which I've said in multiple lectures already, so I think it'll just be a, a rehash of what I've already told you. Uh, we'll talk about firewalls, intrusion detection systems, anti-spyware, um, how you know wireless encryption works and all these things. So basically the whole point of today's lecture is to talk about different types of technologies that we use in order to employ either defensive mechanisms or to ensure that uh, protective kind of um, capabilities are put in place. So, you know, as general users are operating uh, on the network, um, they don't even have to think about whether or not they're secure or not. It's just secure because of the technologies that we have in place. Or there's a couple of technologies that we'll cover where it's more about uh, waiting and detecting when bad stuff happens, right? So that's really something you got to remember, like <clears throat> with the use of technology for security purposes in a, you know, in an organizational ca uh, capability, you really have kind of two things. You have things that protect from bad stuff happening, and then you need things that detect when bad stuff does happen. It's not exclusively just protecting. The idea that you can like build a strong enough wall to keep someone out uh, is just no longer the case. It's much more about resiliency. Um, limiting the amount of people that can get in, but when they do get in, that you're quickly able to identify and, um, you know, basically evict them as soon as possible. Okay, so as I mentioned, we've already talked about a bunch of great stuff, including computer crime and computer security, but now let's talk about systems and software. So a virus scanner, right? So we've talked about antivirus scanners, kind of, you know, endpoint detection and response is really what they've turned into, or EDR solutions, but they basically work in two ways, signature-based and behavior-based. And uh, like I said, I've told you this a couple times already this semester, but signature-based <clears throat> is kind of like um, using those MD5 hashes. Remember in the last lecture with crypto, I did the hashing of the file. That's basically what signature hash, um, signature matching is. You have to constantly download a, a, you know, an updated dic uh, definition dictionary with all the hashes on it. Your system's constantly gotta be checking all files for all hashes. It's pretty intensive, and frankly, it's just not super effective because it's very easy to change um, the way a virus works, right? When we talked about viruses in section three or four, we talked about polymorphic viruses, right, that rewrite themselves each iteration. Even adding a single space, you know, like a single space to a program changes its hash, right? So you can definitely change the hash without affecting the actual functionality of the software. <clears throat> What's much more effective and much more common these days is behavior-based or heuristics-based, you might hear it called. And this is basically like watching what it's doing. Is it, you know, is there like a normal process spawning an additional process? Is it writing to weird places in memory? Is it reaching out to um, odd, you know, websites or, you know, IP addresses and stuff like that? And if it is, does it pass some threshold? And if it does, let's stop it, right? This is definitely the way it operates in today's modern, you know, corporate environment. Um, okay, so basically the slides are just gonna confirm what I just told you, right? So um, this is the kind of the signature-based one. It does point out that it scans not just files, which is what I was mostly talking about, but it scans kind of uh, network connections coming in and out, emails coming in and out, like if you have an attachment on the email, more likely it'll scan that attachment before it allows you to download it. Although most modern web, uh, excuse me, most modern email gateways actually will scan the attachment before they deliver it to your inbox. So this is kind of uh, deprecated. Right, so heuristics based, um, here are just some examples of things that would be kind of odd, right? Automating email, we talked about some of the older viruses in the 90s and early 2000s that did that, changing system files, changing permissions, writing to places they shouldn't be, right? We talked about the boot sector. Um, that's kind of a, a popular way to root yourself into the system like in a rootkit style. So there's, there's all sorts of different behaviors and that's why like 
detection engineering is is a whole field and like having indicators of compromise which is like what are the behaviors of malware are those are those are the type of things that people in my circles share with each other so we can uh, tune our tools to be able to find this type of behavior whatever whatever this type of behavior is for a given um, you know malicious campaign <clears throat> yep, virus scanners that run constantly. People in IT will complain about it or end users will complain about it because they're like, oh, this thing takes up so much system resources. When I stop it, my computer works faster, uh, which I, I understand. You know, hopefully a lot of the new scanners, the ones that I'm talking about that are uh, heuristics based uh, and signature based, like they'll do both of them. Like they'll actually throttle down um, when the computer is in heavy use and they'll throttle up. So they're actually kind of like dynamic to not max out the computer's processor, but actually just use what's available uh, to address that concern that end users typically have. Um, right. Okay, so with the email, right? So examine the email on the server. It's, it's typically not the email. Really with email, there's two things that you're looking for. One is like hyperlinks to things. Like what, what does that hyperlink go to? Uh, and modern scanners will actually run that hyperlink in a, they're called detonation chambers or sandboxes. They'll run it and, and <clears throat> go to it and then do some type of analysis. Like, is it is it trying to scan me? Is it trying to push some type of malware to me? Is it a legit site? Is, is Was the site just created in the last 24 hours? These type of things. And then give it like a grade. And if it's legit, they'll pass it on to the end user. And if not, they'll either like remove the hyperlink or they'll rewrite the hyperlink um, or they just won't deliver the email. Also scanning the attachment files, uh, like I said. So it, it's not uncommon um, to get an email and have the attachment stripped off. That may have happened to you in your experience working at a company or something because it's just, um, there's nothing malicious about the email. It's really the attachment that was malicious. Or there's a lot of like standard uh, file extensions that you cannot send an email, right? You cannot send a executable file in email, like in most modern <clears throat> email gateways. They just won't allow it. Right, so file scanning, obviously that's what I've been talking about, just scanning the files to see if they're malicious. Uh, the signatures, um, you know, scanning the static file won't tell you it's dynamic behavior. It won't tell you what type of um, heuristics it would do, right? That a static file is a static file. Um, so that's what that file scanning is doing. But sandboxing is where I told you it'll kind of detonate it in a little virtual machine to see what happens. What is it doing? Is it doing malicious behaviors? Because many malicious pieces of software don't realize that they're in a sandbox. So they'll just do what they're going to do when they get run. The more advanced ones, the advanced persistent threats um, that, you know, we'll look at through the semester, like North Korea, China, Israel, United States, um, Russia, <clears throat> obviously, um, they'll actually write malware that before it, de uh, before it like runs its payload, whatever it's going to do, uh, it'll actually check to see if it's being analyzed. It's called anti-reverse engineer, anti-reverse or anti-malware analysis checks. And it'll check to see like, are there like common um, analysis tools running? Cause like malware, you can see what executables, what processes are running. Like, is there a debugger running? Is there, you know, IDA, which is a very popular uh, disassembler running? Uh, you know, all these different things. And if it detects that it's being analyzed, it'll self, uh, it'll either self shut itself down, it'll self delete, um, it, it will not want to get analyzed. So it's, it's kind of a, a cool technique uh, that the more advanced malware does. So an, uh, other kinds of scanning, right? So active code scanning. Some code can be um, fileless, right? So it'll run, it'll run in memory. Um, or it'll be like mobile code. So like you visit a website in Google Chrome, but then there's some like ActiveX thing running um, in the background and ActiveX and Java, ActionScript, Adobe Flash, those were notorious for being uh, really buggy and, and easy to exploit. So you'd go to a website that has some like type of exploit for ActiveX on it. And then, you know, you run it with your ActiveX controller and it exploits it and gets access to your box and off you go. So you could have scanners kind of scanning that mobile code before it executes on site, um, excuse me, on your box, uh, for example. 
Here's just a couple commercial ones you've heard of, uh, likely Semantics, another big one. Um, Kaspersky is kind of interesting because it's from Russia and, um, you know, the government a couple years ago was using it across the federal government and then they banned it um, because of kind of the Russia, I don't know, kind of like cyber cold war thing that we got going on right now. But uh, there's some really, you know, good ones here. Um, AVG is popular. Webroot is another popular one. Um, most, this says commercial antivirus. I would say that antivirus is more common for residential uh, use or like personal use, right? Um, commercial use, like actual commercial use for like businesses and stuff, you don't really use antivirus. You use endpoint detection and response, EDR, or some people are calling it XDR now, which I think is just a marketing buzzword, but essentially it's just like antivirus, except it, it has more capability to allow analysts, like sec security operations analysts, like you know me or whatever, to be able to quickly like jump into the box, do some triaging, look at indicators of compromise, figure out what's going on, query other machines in the environment um, to see what they're doing, look at what processes are running. So it's like a really much bigger host of capability that the EDR solutions are providing. And it's again, it's like very much the modern successor to antivirus. So let's switch gears and talk about firewalls. Antivirus is much more for the endpoint, right? You, like our workstation, our email coming to our workstation. Firewalls are at the network layer. And you're going to be so glad that you paid attention to lecture two, where we talked about networking, because <clears throat> it's going to get deep here, hooking into those lessons learned, okay? So a firewall, you may have heard of, it's basically what it says there, barrier that sits between the network that we're on and the outside world. So think of like your house, right? In your house, you probably have your private network, your non-public -route, non routable IP address scheme, right? 192.168. whatever. whatever. And then you have the internet. Now, what keeps people from the internet from coming into your house? The firewall. But I mean, it's it's much simpler on a residential basis. But effectively, there is some type of um, access control list or rules that allow and disallow. But in a corporate environment, you're going to have way more apps. You're going to have way more traffic. You might have vendors remoting into your environment. You may be collaborating. You may be using all sorts of cloud-based solutions. So the traffic's going everywhere. So you use a firewall to basically explicitly allow or explicitly deny certain traffic from traversing. And the real cool advanced firewalls will actually be uh, updated regularly with threat feeds, threat intel from the vendor, like Palo Alto is a, an amazing firewall company. And when they find like, oh, this IP address over here is a known malicious IP address, they'll automatically update your firewall and not allow traffic to go to that IP address. So it's very, very cool. It makes it makes my job easier um, from, from uh, protecting my users from going to bad places. But basically you can see we filter packets. Remember, packets are at the layer three, right? The network layer. We can filter packets based on different things. Where is the packet coming from? Where is it going? What type of protocol is it? Like you can use a firewall, for example. Like let's say that you work at a company and they don't want people watching Netflix at work, right? You can use a firewall to block Netflix's IP address as a destination, you can use a firewall to stop whatever the protocol is that Netflix streams, right? We talked about UDP for streaming. So maybe you just block all UDP, that would that would solve the problem. You'd also block a ton of other stuff, right? So you gotta be careful when you're using firewalls. Uh, typically you, you would say <clears throat> kind of a destination, uh, like netflix.com, you, you might block it that way or the IP address. So it's used to protect you know, trusted networks from untrusted. And it's not always um, at the edge of a network, right? Sometimes, like, let's say you're a bigger company and you want to really protect your accounting department, your finance department. <clears throat> so maybe you stick another firewall there. Or I worked at a hospital for years uh, and we've got all these old machines, these old <clears throat> x-ray machines or whatever you want to, you know, special medical uh, devices that literally are running on very, very old software like Windows XP, like you can't patch it, you can't secure it, you can't do anything with it. 
it's worth you know we, we paid four million dollars for it and it still works so despite the fact that it's end of life management says we're not getting rid of it so what do you do well you put a firewall between it right that that helps protect that segment of really at risk systems from the rest of your network right so that's another use case for firewalls it says cisco's well known for firewalls they are <clears throat> they're more known for like routers and uh, switches vpn concentrators Firewalls have really kind of blossomed into their own niche. Uh, Palo Alto is really, really sweet uh, firewall company. I've used their firewalls. They're amazing. Um, you can have hardware or software. That's true. The hardware ones are more robust. The software ones are good. Software, you know, is better for uh, an endpoint. Like you have a firewall on your computer, right? We we've all heard of Windows Firewall, right? Most of you have probably disabled it, right? Because <laughs> it's stopping you from doing something you want. So <clears throat> what are the different types of firewalls? You can do packet filtering, which is what I just told you about. Like uh, don't allow um, traffic to netflix.com. Don't allow traffic from netflix.com, whatever you want. Then there's stateful packet inspection. This is way more intense. So if you remember on the OSI stack, layer three is where like the IP address is and that's where packet filtering happens. With stateful, Literally, the firewall is taking the packet, bringing it up to layer seven, the app layer, and looking at the actual data in it, like your username and password, right, or whatever. It's it's here where you want you would do stateful packet inspection if you were like in a really classified facility or something like that, and you want to make sure that stuff isn't going out that shouldn't be, or people aren't because you can like it's not always obvious that you're sending a file to like Dropbox. Sometimes you can like embed stuff in like DNS traffic or you can, you can like hide stuff in traffic with stateful packet inspection. It's open kimono, right? There's no hiding anything. Okay. Then there's application firewalls. And sometimes you hear uh, like WAF web application firewall. And you know, that's basically a firewall, at the at the at layer seven at the application layer allowing um you know maybe you only allow certain users from a certain country or maybe like your like your gambling site um in the state of new jersey which i, I know this for a fact right so new jersey like online gambling in new jersey is for new jersey residents only so if you're from a different state you can't use their site even though it's accessible Right. So you might be able to use a web application firewall in that capacity to kind of mitigate who's who's able to access it and who's not. OK. Network host based. Right. Where's the next one? Dual home host. OK, so network host based, um, as I mentioned, host based. I mean, this is kind of confusing, like network host based because it's usually network based or host based. But basically, let me. Re yeah. So this one is more host-based, right? So you install a firewall software on an endpoint, uh, like a Unix box or something, right? And then all traffic flows through there. And basically the firewall software is running in like on top of the operating system. And they're pointing out here that the challenge with this is that you have to harden the operating system because if someone can get in there, then they can attack the firewall software. This is part of the reason why a hardware firewall solution is so much better. It's just one of the reasons. They have much, much better uh, performance as well. Dual home host, right? Installed on a server with at least two network interfaces, which makes sense because you've got your outside network and your inside network and traffic has to flow through it. That's the deal. It's, it's, like, it's, like, a, it's like an airlock. It has to flow through it. Um, and there's, there's no getting around it, right? Router-based firewall. Um, yeah, this is kind of like how your home network is protected, basically. Um, <clears throat> routers, um, if you recall, routers separate networks from each other. They're layer three routing um, at the IP level, which allows for packet filtering, which is natural because that's where the packets are. Uh, so this is kind of your standard conventional basic firewall, right? Router-based firewalls. Um, screened host is another one that you know, I don't uh, particularly see very often, uh, but this one is kind of not unlike the um, network host base one that we're calling it here, which is just a host base one. The screen host is like 
it's like a host with a uh, firewall software running on it and traffic flows through it to go, you know, back to the other side of the network, right? You, you don't see this a lot of time. Um, a bastion host is typically like a jump box uh, or it's like, it, think of it this way. The idea is that in, the only way to get into this network segment, um, like let's say it's the, the, it, the HVAC system at a hospital, right? The, the, the facility system, it controls air conditioning and heating and um, closed circuit cameras, maybe stuff like that. So in order to get to that network, you first have to go to this one machine. And then from that machine, you have to go into the network. That's the only machine. There's like a firewall that only allows that machine, that IP really, uh, into that network segment. So then everybody has to go through there. So you're basically making a choke point, which is another way to kind of control access uh, from a network perspective, right? Because if you need to like um, protect that network like quickly, like there's like an outbreak, ransomware outbreak or something on your network, you can just shut down that ba that bastion host or that, that uh, screened host and you know, you can effectively know that that network segment is safe. Here's a couple examples of firewalls. You know, you can Google it, Zone Alarm, Cisco, Windows Defender, Windows Defender being a uh, host-based local one. I also point out uh, PFSense is another very, very popular open source one. A lot of people use it in their home labs when they're trying to get uh, used to firewalls and stuff like that. I believe we do a lab with PFSense and we actually kind of, it's a very simple lab, but I think you'll enjoy it. It allows us to basically ping a machine <clears throat> and then we set up a firewall rule and then we try to ping again and it doesn't work. And it's because the firewall is doing its job, which is fantastic. All right. Yeah. All firewall logs activity, which is, you know, huge, right? Uh, like a lot of the stuff in my world is building a really strong defense and then when bad stuff happens you have to go to the logs to, to see what happened how bad was it where else did it go uh, so firewall logs are important I actually had something happen today that I wish I wish we I had more firewall logs uh, to be candid so very very valuable it tells you all the traffic what hosts went where when they did it um, you know you could start to piece together it's very forensic -y, right to make up a word um, it, it's very forensic-y to piece together the story to understand what the attack looked like and really so you can have assurance that you got them out of your environment or that they didn't take data out of your environment or that they were unsuccessful um, in, in getting, you know, whatever, the jewels, whatever those were, right? So it's, it's huge. Um, Plus, I might point out firewall log activity from just a performance perspective. Um, <laughs> a lot of people, when they can't do something, will blame the firewall. Like people who don't work in the infosec or the firewall, they'll be like, oh, I'm trying to go to this site and I can't do it. It's firewall stopping me. Uh, so you have to go to the firewall logs to see, is this actually happening? Like, what's your IP address? Hey, guess what? You're actually... Um, not being blocked by the firewall, it looks like that resource that you're trying to go to actually doesn't exist or you typed it in wrong or a million other things that's not the firewall, right? So a, a lot of value in firewall logs. So we did talk about spyware, how it can be used in espionage, which is really, really cool. Um, but there's anti-spyware technology software uh, that can help you scan your system effectively to see if it's been compromised. Um, creepware, Stalkerware, these kind of fall into the spyware thing where your webcam's turned on without your knowing it, your screen captures are taken, files are added or removed from your computer. Um, they offer here a subscription service to keep spyware file definitions up to date, whatever. Um, there's different licensing models for any of these software. Most, most modern vendors are going to a subscription model, meaning that you pay like X dollars a month for some software as a service and then <clears throat> they have like a brain in the cloud that's doing a lot of intense stuff and you just have a client that pulls down relevant information by the day. Um, and so instead of like $300 one-time fee, you pay $10 a month. And then obviously the vendor's hoping that, you know, you stay on longer than 30 months. So they end up getting like whatever, $500, $600, $700 for the use of their software in you as a client. All right. IDS. Okay, so this is a pretty popular um, tool. 
in our environment. Um, you know, IDS is, yes, they are popular, but they're kind of like almost, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They've almost been like um, broken into other pieces now where like you still have IDS type functionality, but it's embedded in like um, a SIM which is a, a, a security incident and event management tool, which is a pretty standard tool in, the, in our world, or a firewall or an EDR solution. Like, like this functionality still exists, but it's kind of blended. Like you can just own an IDS appliance, but that doesn't, that happens a lot less now. But anyways, how does an intrusion detection software or system or solution, depending on how you assemble it, how does it work, right? So basically it looks at inbound and outbound traffic kind of like the firewall but the firewall just says is this allowed or not allowed right it's just following the rules that we configured it to do like a firewall is like a gate uh, a guard at a gate and we told the guard don't let anyone wearing green pants in so everybody that tries to walk in the guard stops him and looks at their pants red pants go blue pants go green pants no right the the firewall, the guard, isn't really making any intelligence decision. The intrusion detection is like, like the guard, but with a different purpose. So it's like, hey, don't allow anyone that's sneaking stuff into their pockets, right? So the firewall is like, only cares about the color of the pants because it's something that it can see. But the uh, intrusion detection, right, it's like looking at it. It's like, hey, like, you know, obviously you can bring some stuff in or, or like you came in with like your pockets kind of full and you're leaving and your pockets are wicked full, right? So clearly you've added something to you. You've got a problem. I'm going to detect it and maybe do something with it, right? Um, so that's kind of like, I just made that up. That's like kind of a simple example that conveys a little bit of the difference between an IDS and a firewall, right? So it's looking for kind of, that heuristics, that behavior. If, if someone's trying to log in to an account, my account, you're trying to break into my Canvas account, so you're going to change your grade, right? If there's like 500 invalid or, you know, unsuccessful attempts to log into my account in a row in an hour, chances are it's not me. Chances are there is an attempted brute force intrusion into my account, right? We saw this with the NCRAC lab. So intrusion detection would catch that, maybe shut my account down as one way to handle that. Um, maybe alert someone, I don't know. Um, maybe lock the account out for 15 minutes and not allow any attempts to be tried. So there, there's all sorts of things, but like that functionality would be handled in kind of the identity and access management system. And the, the first example I gave you would be handled more in the firewall. So you, you see, I hope you're beginning to see like why I was telling you the IDS capability is actually kind of just distributed across other um, tools and capabilities, all right? Oh, but we will talk about a couple other like non-technical IDS approaches, right? So intrusion detection, right? It can detect uh, misuse versus anomaly, right? So, you know, if like I actually have a valid account, but I'm taking something I shouldn't. Uh, that's misuse anomaly is like um, my computer or like, you know, some endpoint is, is like, uh, like pushing all sorts of data to some random weird IP looking like a data exfiltration, right? That's anomalous. They have passive systems versus reactive systems. Essentially, that's the difference between an intrusion detection system and an intrusion prevention system, if you've heard that term, IDS, IPS. And basically what it means is detection will notify me <laughs> that there's a problem. Um, prevention, intrusion prevention will actually do something about it, right? So it shuts off the port, it locks out the account, it does some action that, you know, we've configured it to do in advance. Like if this, this, and this, then do this. That's, that's the proactive one. And you gotta be careful with it, right? Because if you configure it to shut an account down and it does it and it's a false positive, you've effectively locked out someone, committed a denial of service on your own user base. And if it's something like, um, you know, I don't know, like uh, um, this doesn't really happen, but if it's like a really sensitive system or it's like a manufacturing system or it's connected to a human type system, you could have really bad consequences by accidentally shutting it off, which is the reason why you don't always just do intrusion prevention, right? You've got to be 
careful. So sometimes it, it requires a human touch. Okay. Uh, IDS says network based versus host based. Another pretty standard approach. Think about this with the network base. Yes, you're looking at the network traffic, but you're able to see like more endpoints. And really, if you stick it in the right place, like at a choke point, like we talked about before with choke points, if you stick the IDS right before the outlet out into the internet, all traffic has to flow through it. So you get that visibility. Host based is exactly what it sounds like. You're just looking at traffic on that host. You would I mean, EDR solutions, as I mentioned, do bake in some of this functionality into their um, capabilities for the hosts that they're hosting on. But for the most part, you'd only really ratchet up um, intrusion detection type capabilities on a uh, host if it was a more sensitive or, you know, it was a beefy system because it's going to be taking a lot of resources to be analyzing all the behavior, right? Because it's got to look at everything. It doesn't know normal behavior versus... Uh, abnormal behavior. Okay. Oh, of course, like, you know, it's funny. I like regularly, like, we'll talk to the slide. Like, I'll, I'll explain everything and then realize that the next slide is more of a, a drill down into it. So um, at least it reinforces what I'm saying, right? So um, misuse. Um, okay. So again, compares it to known attack si signatures, um, more signature based. But again, it's looking for things that you can you can tell it is a misuse, like you can define it. Anomaly is much more heuristic and behavior based, right? Like it doesn't look right. Uh, hopefully you're beginning to see the pattern that signature and heuristics are kind of like the two options for detecting things. Again, passive and reactive. We've talked about this. Um, yeah, when it sees something, it records it and lets you know uh, versus actually intervening. Yeah, analyzes network traffic or the individual host. I just explained to you why you would use each of these and uh, what they are, so yay me. Okay, so IDS approaches. <clears throat> There's four different approaches, right? Uh, some of these are gonna be more obvious than others, but when we think intrusion detection, like when you tell someone who works in my industry, intrusion detection system, IDS, I mean, it even says software right here on the slide. Everybody thinks of an appliance or a piece of software that does what I just told you. Almost acts like a really smart firewall or an EDR solution. These are other approaches to um, not really intrusion detection, but other approaches to mitigating intrusion risk, okay? Let's get into each of them. Preemptive blocking. This is brilliant, right? Um, this is basically hardening your environment setting up those rules, having that kind of reactive system configuration that, hey, like, let's really uh, set up explicit rules on the firewall that only these resources can get to these resources. Let's be super stringent, super strict. Um, if we see anything happening that's weird, right? Like we see someone copying a file over the network, we stop them immediately and we block the user until they can explain what's going on. If we see someone connecting to Google Drive, we block the user, shut off their IP address until they can explain it, right? This is very, very hard to do in practice because end users are going to have all sorts of different use cases and you're, you're going to end up blocking them and you're going to spend so much time unblocking them because most of them are going to have a legitimate explanation or they're executives and they just want policy exceptions all over the place. So this is another like light touch, soft touch. You do see this, but it's very much like very obvious things like don't go to, like don't allow anyone to log in between like midnight and 6 a.m. because you're a nine to five operation. You might even say eight o'clock to 6 a.m., right? Like nobody's working in the evening, so no one should be logging in. So we can legitimately block access for that time. You, you do some, some of these kind of like sweeping, obvious um, rules, uh, you don't get very nuanced or niche with this type of rule because of just the, the, the maintenance nightmare that would come from it. Then we have infiltration. Now this one probably gets my Intel majors all pumped up and excited. Now this one is all human based. This has nothing to do with software. I mean, it kind of has something to do with software, but this has nothing to do with like a technical solution. This is basically acting like a threat uh, intelligence agent or cyber intelligence agent, but getting deployed, you know, quote unquote in the field, you could still work from your keyboard in, in your house, 
but it's basically, a, you know, kind of assuming a pseudonym, uh, a sock puppet account maybe, getting into the criminal underground, getting on the dark web, using Tor browsers, getting, you know, basically plugged into the criminal cyber criminal underground. And then, and, and this is a real job. There's a lot of people do that. I get threat intel feeds from organizations that have people implanted in these type of, you know, hacker collectives or uh, cyber criminal undergrounds. And they'll say like, hey, um, you know, like there's a there's a, a major healthcare company, right? Like uh, that that has uh, their cre their username and passwords are for sale right now, and it looks like it's um, I don't know the Mayo Clinic, right? So now you can like before they get sold, right? I mean they're already compromised, so you, you're not going to win that war. But before they get sold and in the wrong hands, Threat Intel will get released. Through, like there's like restricted channels. Like I'm a member of restricted channels that you have to be like vetted to get into. So you can do um, Intel sharing without basically exposing it to your adversary. And they'll, they'll say like, hey, Mayo Clinic, like you, your whole, you're, you guys are in deep trouble. Like all of your username and passwords have been compromised. So get started now on changing your passwords for everybody um, so you can get ahead of that. So like that's that's one uh, use of like this type of capability. And it, it's actually not super exotic and super foreign. Like this is, this is a thing. Now, if you work at like a 10 person company and you're not, you're not having like, you know, Carol in the IT department, you're not going to like deploy her to Romania, uh, to get like built, like bricked into this thing. You just, there's organizations that do threat intelligence um, and then you kind of like subscribe to their feeds. But if you want to get a job like this, you could certainly do that, right? Um, check out Cisco Talos, right? They're, um, they're a big kind of threat intel company. They certainly have some people in there. Google's definitely got some people in there. Um, but anyways, very cool. Intrusion deflection is another one. So honeypots, if you haven't heard of a honeypot, it's basically like, it's like a fake system. It's it's absolutely real. You can deploy it. It's fine, uh, but it's designed to look very attractive. But it has zero value in reality because you got to remember your adversaries, cyber criminals. They don't know that this box is where your enterprise database is, and this box is complete garbage. But it's a honeypot, right? They'll attack either one because they don't know. And a honeypot, you have it all set up so like someone pops a honeypot, right? No big deal. There's no value to it, but they it, it might as well be like a, a string with a bunch of pots and pans on it. Like you set that honey pot up to be loud and super noisy to you when it gets popped, uh, which basically alerts you that someone's in your environment. You can put it in a DMZ uh, or you can make it internet facing. That way um, you can kind of see like what type of uh, attacks are targeting you and what techniques and stuff like that. But real value of honeypots is sticking them in your network somewhere because really no one should ever be hitting them. So when they get hit, that's a problem, right? And then you can have, you can, we can use our firewall logs. We can use our net flows across our SIM or security incident and event management and look at the IP of the honeypot and look at all the traffic talking to it. So is it, is it Bob and accounting's machine that's talking to the honeypot? Let's go talk to Bob. Bob, what are you doing? Well, Bob has no idea what he's doing because Bob was unaware because his, his machine is compromised. Let's go back to the logs. Where's, when did Bob's machine get compromised? Where did it get compromised from? Bob, de well, or like whatever, Tina downloaded um, a, a, a fake Chrome update that ran JavaScript, that ran PowerShell, that pulled down a malicious um, Cobalt Strike Remote, remote access tool from a C2 server, loaded it on Tina's machine. Tina's machine scanned the network, found Bob's, infected Bob's machine, and then Bob hit the honeypot, right? You can piece that all together with the logs. And what I just told you is like a real scenario. Like that's not fake. That can totally happen. It has happened, frankly. But a honeypot is basically like a... Um, an alarm that you get to control, right? And you can make it as cool as you want uh, and, and awesome as you want. Let me show you something really cool. This is an example of a honeypot I built just for fun. I stuck it out on the internet. It was up in AWS, which is a cloud service provider. I made it wicked juicy. I had all sorts of open ports like remote desktop, which is something you should never have open to the internet. 
and I just let it fly. And it was set up so even if you popped it, you really didn't get in. It looked like port 3389 was open on an IP, right? Remember layer four, layer three? Uh, but it was fake. It wasn't really running remote desktop, right? But you can see um, here, like look at all the countries. Like my, my server was like in Virginia and we've got all of these European countries, a bunch of, um, you know, Pacific Rim type countries attacking it. Uh, South Africa was in there. We've got some South America. You know, what, what was really weird was Brazil, um, which is typically not associated with a lot of malicious activity. Like I haven't seen many threat intel reports on Brazil. Uh, you can see, well, you can't really see because my big head's in the way, but like Brazil right here is this big, thick line right here. Like they were hammering my server for a while. So this is just another use case of honeypots. It gives people like me uh, intel to understand like, like I know it's very hard to see, but like basically these are the ports they're trying to hit. 445, 22, 53, 3389, and 8088, right? So most of these ports are basically used for like administration, right? 22 is secure shell in. Uh, 3389 is remote desktop. So these are common ones that threat actors are going to try because they're going to try to log into your machine and take it over because maybe you got, you know, weak credentials or whatever. So anyways, this is a, this is what a honeypot looks like when you're actually kind of like using it. It's pretty cool, right? All right. All right. Back on to the lecture. All right. Intrusion deterrence. Here's, here's another kind of attempt. And this one does get used um, a little bit more often um, you know, you try to make your juicy, you don't name your juicy target, like, um, company financial server or, you know, master password list or anything like that. You try to, um, make it as much as you make a honeypot look super juicy and super delicious and super come hit me. You try to make your more valuable assets look more plain, right? You, you may have extra, uh, alerting on them. You might have a firewall specifically in front of those things. You might have a host space firewall on them. Um, what else could you do? Um, you could, you could like, I don't advise this, but you, some people do this. You could name like your, your patient database. You could name it like uh, facilities inventory or something like that, like misname it. So uh, someone's less likely to catch it. That, that practice uh, it usually does more harm than good, but that, that's an example. You're basically trying to make your juicy targets less less juicy. Okay. All sorts of IDS providers, right? Snort is probably one of the more popular ones if you want to play with it. Um, it's kind of like a firewall where you, like, you basically configure it to do certain things, and it does it if it sees those things. Um, I don't know if Snort is heuristic space, um, but the way it gets its threat feed might be dynamic, so... Anyways, unless you're going to go into cybersecurity and actually work in an organization and then level up several levels, like three, four, five years of experience, um, no one's probably going to ask you to sit down and configure an IDS, right? It just, you know, so, okay. Let's talk about authentication for a minute. Okay, so authentication is basically when you give your password to a system and you successfully authenticate. It's basically proving to a system or an environment or network, it's proving that you are in fact who you say you are, right? So I've been given credentials to log into Canvas as a faculty member. So when I log in, I authenticate. And because I shouldn't share my password with anyone, I'm the only one who's got it. When I authenticate, the system says, okay, I know who you are. Now, if one of you get my password and you log in, you're authenticating, but because the trust is in the secrecy of the password, the system says, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're Jerry, you're, you're logged in. And that, that, this is what authentication is. So every time you ever have to like log into a system, you're, you're actually authenticating. And that's why, um, they call it multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. When you do the six digit pins or you get the text messages or you get the email with the six numbers, right? That's what we're doing. You're proving you are who you say you are. Let's go through a couple different protocols around authentication. 
This is a lot like when we saw the wireless technologies and bandwidth uh, in one of the early lectures. You're basically going to see that it gets progressively better, either more options or more secure, right? So PAP is kind of one of the OG ones sent in unencrypted plain text. As you recall from the crypto lecture, sending anything unencrypted is terrible, right? We have tools to sniff, sniff network traffic, Wireshark, if you want to Google one. Um, sending unencrypted traffic is not a good idea, um, but, but this is how we started. In fact, just as a quick story, um, you know, when I was younger, I used to ride the train in to, to work in Boston, and uh, you could just turn on Wireshark and basically sniff traffic in the air and pull username and passwords right out of the air because they were being sent across an unencrypted network traffic communication um, using unencrypted uh, communicate or transmission of the username and password, right? So obviously not good. So let's let's upgrade to Shiva, right? So SPAP, we, we get PAP, but basically they're encrypting it. So they've done it. They've done a good job here by uh, increasing the level of security of uh, communication. Then we move into CHAP, right? Now, CHAP is cool because um, it basically, it, it, it reconfirms with you periodically that you are in fact who you say you are. Um, so it, it's just a little bit more of a way to maintain that this is a legit session. Someone hasn't hijacked your session, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can see that they're using hashes here. Um, remember we talked about MD5 hashes. Let's go into Kerberos. Now Kerberos is still used today. Kerberos is like very, very legit. It's how Active Directory um, works as far as like granting access to resources on a network. And Active Directory is basically, what is this T doing here? Huh. I didn't notice that. Uh, Active Directory is basically uh, like the main kind of resource management for a Windows network, which is like 95% of any network in the world, like a company network, organizational network. So, and Kerberos is what's, is what's doing kind of, not the, it, it kind of manages the authentication piece. I, I'm, I'll admit I'm not a Kerberos expert, uh, but this is what it's used for. And it's, it's actually quite good. Like I said, it's still being used today. Named after a three-headed dog invented at MIT. Um, Kerberos gets wicked confusing too, by the way, because you have to get like a ticket and then there's like a ticket granting server that grants a ticket to the ticket granting system. It's It gets messed up, but basically just know that Kerberos is what we use today and it's legit. VPNs. Now you may be using VPNs personally. Uh, they've, they've come quite popular as, you know, privacy basically uh, has eroded for the individual and, um, you know, the use of digital uh, systems and digital uh, solutions have become more and more mainstream. So a VPN, just to make it quite simple, um, is a way for you to establish an encrypted network connection with some endpoint before you ever send anything else, right? And it uses these protocols to establish it. And basically the way it works is you have a VPN client. You might use this for work. You have a VPN client on your system, your computer. There's two actually VPNs. You can do a network to network or you can do host space, but we'll talk host space first. You got a VPN client on your computer, right? You turn on your VPN. It reaches out to a VPN server somewhere that you've got, you know, configured, establishes a connection, and now you have a direct tunnel before you exit to the internet, right? So wh why would you do this? Well, if someone's trying to like sniff your traffic, like I was talking about before, because it's, well, yeah, the network connection is going to be encrypted. If someone's trying to sniff your network traffic, they can't because it's encrypted. More importantly, um, to, to really drive home the point, when you use a VPN, if you're going to like connect into your home office or your, your, your work office, your remote office, your company office or whatever, when you establish a VPN connection, it's like you're on their network now, right? So you've got access to network resources that you wouldn't be able to get over the internet. Another thing that people use VPNs for that really drives home the point of what its utility can be, if you've ever tried to watch um, something like in a different state, right? Like, like say you're trying to watch like a, a football game online 
and it says, oh, this is blacked out because of local market rights, right? Um, if you go on a VPN and you jump off to a different state and then you go to that same resource, it's gonna look like you're coming from wherever. So that'll work. You also see that with international stuff. So a lot of international things will be like, oh, you can't view this outside the United States. Well, all you have to do is set up a VPN connection that terminates in Dallas and then pop out there and now you're in the United States according to what the system is vetting you against, seeing where your traffic's coming from. So that's that's a couple of use cases of VPNs, right? So how do we, what kind of protocols are we using? PPTP, L2TP, and IPsec, which is um, kind of the common one and it's, it's used with L2TP, right? So point-to-point -point protocol, right? Um, basically uses that CHAP um, protocol for authentication. It does encryption you know this is good excuse me this is good but i don't really know many uh organizations that are using this right now but it is an option right what you see a lot of organizations using is a mixture of layer 2 tunneling protocol and ipsec so layer 2 tunneling um offers you know chap and eep which is what these offer right but also three other ones which is kind of cool. So it gives a little bit more versatility. Now we talked about PAP being really bad, right? Because it sent clear text and then Shiva encrypts it. Well, here's the thing. The actual IPsec tunnel is already encrypted, right? So you're kind of like building a shell around your unencrypted traffic, but it's encrypted, right? So like when it terminates to where it's going, then it would be unencrypted. And maybe that's how you want it from an architecture perspective, because maybe you want to analyze or you want to see like what, what's coming through or whatever. Or maybe you have antiquated technology that can't handle um, encrypted stuff um, at, the, at the Shiva password level. But for the most part, you'll go with the most secure option. I mean, that's like, why wouldn't you if, this, if your software can handle it? IPsec tunnels, uh, very common. You'll hear that phrase, um, you know, if you're running around in um, network security circles, you'll hear IPsec. It's, it's pretty much the standard tunnel for uh, building these encrypted connections between either, like I mentioned, an end user to a VPN concentrator where it terminates into your business or whatever, or um, you'll see businesses uh, establish an IPsec tunnel to each other uh, because let's say you have um, a company that's going to be helping you, I don't know, build something, right? Well, you might give, you might build a tunnel between your two networks and then allow them access on your side to like, this network segment or to these five computers or whatever and then you don't have to ha like you don't have to give them vpn software you don't have to give them local accounts to be able to authenticate in like they'll just they'll just be able to come across the network and then once that works done you terminate the the vpn connection now talking about wireless security for a second we're, we're going to go through a couple of these protocols um and again, they just get more secure as they get older, right? So originally wireless secure, uh, there wasn't even wireless security. Originally wireless networks, you just like walk up uh, and you you know throw up your phone and you look for an open network. Back in the day when this was going around, we didn't even have phones that could get wireless. But the, the point is um, wireless network wasn't good. And the whole reason I could be on that train and, and pull people's username and passwords out of the sky uh, was because... The network traffic wasn't encrypted. It was just network traffic flying around. So WEP was the first attempt um, at securing that network traffic. It required you to um, kind of authenticate or, you know, ha have a password to get onto. Like, it it's so common now when you go to, like, Starbucks. Well, Starbucks typically has open wireless access, but you, you go somewhere and it's like, oh, the password is, like, you know, whatever, Chicago 2014 or whatever. So... WEP is the first attempt at this, right? And it really did work. It, it made the traffic um, encrypted. But the problem was WEP was super easy to break uh, because of a flaw in this 24-bit, um, uh, excuse me, 24-bit um, initialization vector, right? So they had a 104-bit key. Remember we talked about in crypto how important the key is? Well, the problem is this initialization vector was such a small space that you're able to like basically brute force um, a number of attempts and eventually have the key pop out. Um, 
I've, I've done it myself. It, it's, it's not very complicated. WEP is completely broken. You should never use WEP. If you see someone using WEP and you care about them, you should tell them to change it. WPA is definitely, uh, this is explaining why the initialization vector is so weak. I won't go into it, but basically there's only so many options and computers are wicked fast, so it's easy to break it. Now WPA2 is what you should be using today, but WPA was the first instance of it. It used a temporal key integrity protocol, which means uh, it was time-based, right? Temporal, 128-bit uh, per packet key, which is super intense, right? Uh, and it, dynamic, it dynamically generated a new key for each packet. Um, super intense, a lot better. Um, this has been broken in a way, but it was broken through rainbow tables, right? Remember we talked before about rainbow tables where you'd like pre-calculate hashes and understand like what, what this hash means in this situation. So people have done rainbow tables for WPA. Um, so that kind of led to WPA2, <laughs> which um, introduced advanced encryption standard AES. Now, if you remember the crypto talk I gave you, AES is like the gold standard. It's government grade. It's completely appropriate. It's what we use today. If I see something with AES on it, that I approve of it. Like I will use it in my environment, okay? Um, so it, again, if you see someone using WEP, just have them switch to WPA2, okay? Now WPA3 came out in 2018. I don't know much about WPA3. I haven't seen WPA3 in practice. I don't know why it hasn't been adopted widely. WPA2 is what I see everywhere, both professionally and personally. Um, it does have some interesting new functionality. Um, it looks like you can use it as like, um, a, you know, you can have it in a different kind of mode. Um, Yeah, so the WPA3, you can see um, it's in advance. I, I don't really see this uh, in practice. I see WPA2 all the time, definitely personally and professionally, but WPA3 introduced a, 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 some more functionality, some more effort. Um, you'll notice that they, they make um, attackers interact with the access point every time. Uh, so brute force attempting authentication uh, can be really, really time consuming and challenging. But again, in order to attack uh, the Wi-Fi, you'd have to physically be there in person, which may be part of the reason why WPA3 hasn't gained mainstream adoption yet. So in summary, I know we covered a lot today, right? Firewalls are important. They definitely keep out some bad traffic and allow good traffic out. Uh, proxy server, uh, we kind of talked about this, like that screened host, bastion host, right? Um, basically, you're just trying to put roadblocks in between things that you want to protect and the outside world, because the outside world is full of, um, you know, a diversity of people, good and bad. Um, and, you know, the bad ones are interested in getting into your network and doing bad stuff. So having those layers, both at the front door, this is why defense in depth, if you've ever heard that term is so real. You have defenses at the front door, you have them at the network level, you have them on the host, you have kind of fake things in honeypots. You have naming conventions that might suggest that something's not important. Um, you've got heuristic based, you've got signature based, like it's, 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 you know, you're training your end users, which was outside the scope of this talk, but the whole point is we're layering all sorts of defensive mechanisms, a lot of times with technology in order to help reduce the likelihood that we are effectively attacked or compromised and if we are, when we are, that the blast radius of that impact, that attack, is managed and, and limited to only really, um, you know, like wherever the initial attack vector uh, landed, right? So I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I know we covered like quite a variety of things and just spent a second on wireless network security, but uh, it was a good talk and covered a lot of good stuff. So. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next lecture.